Hi, my friends. Welcome to Radical Civility. My name is Ben Piccini. Today we are talking about Brad Wilcox and his recent remarks that have been um, pretty controversial um, in a lot of different places. Um, in kind of a, a moment of happenstance, uh, Brad Wilcox actually happened to come to BYU-Idaho recently, um, yesterday in fact, and a friend of mine just walked up to him and said, hey, um, I can imagine it's been hard, just want you to know that, you know, have really appreciated you in the past. Um, and Brad looked at him and, and said, you know, it has been really hard. It's been, it's been a really hard week. Um, I think the purpose of our podcast today is not to fix anything or to give the right take. I think that's, that's presumptuous. It's also not to rehash. Um, so we're assuming that if you've, if you're, if you're here, you're, you, you've already listened to what he said. Um, I ha still haven't watched the whole video. I don't know that I ever will, um, just for time and, and priorities and such, but I listened to the, the remarks that have gotten the most traction. Um, we felt like it was an important thing to talk through. So the purpose of, of, um, radical civility is to, uh, go to the pain points and talk about the things that are hard for people. And from the perspective of somebody who's, you know, very deliberately orthodox and faithful in the church. And, um, by the way, for those who don't know, Brad Wilcox is, is uh, a leader in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, and some of my, uh, episodes are, are kind of, um, a free for all. And they can, you know, sometimes they're, they're about any old thing. And, um, some of them are a little bit more geared towards the happenings of, of my church. And this one is one of those. So if that's not your cup of tea, I understand completely. Um, I don't think that we are going to fix things with this podcast, but I think we can model what it looks like to have a diverse group of people come together and say like, Hey, what, you know, what, what, what does it, what does it look like to grapple with this in faithful and deliberate and thoughtful and kind ways? Um, where we're both extending grace and also trying to really grapple honestly. And uh, I think we've managed that. Um, I'm recording this piece after our discussion. And I think what you will find is that there's some really good gems. There are some insights that are really positive and meaningful and deep. And I think, um, you know, after I was done recording with, with the group, I, I felt, was I too hard on, on Brad Wilcox? And then I made it with, maybe I was too easy on Brad Wilcox. Uh, maybe I was too easy on, you know, past injustices and, and, and the story of racism within my own church. Um, and the best answer that I have for that is, yeah, but like the whole point is to try the best that I can and I'll get it a little bit wrong. And I'm sure that some people won't be satisfied, but, um, this feels like the right thing to do. Um, and it feels like, um, it feels like getting a group of people together and talking through this is right. Um, so with that, I will stop talking and, and let you get to the episode. Like I said, um, it may not please everybody, but I think that there is something that anyone can take away from this that they will agree with. And those who know me personally, which is most of the group that listens to this will know that we're really trying here. Um, and we'll take something meaningful away, even if we, even if we don't speak exactly to what they are looking for. So hope you enjoy it. Thank you as always for joining us. As a reminder, the opinions expressed are just those of the individual participants. Um, and I, I choose good friends who I trust, who are thoughtful and deliberate. Um, but that's it. That's my goal. One other note really quick. One of the participants asked if I could mention the great work that the Genesis Project has done. Um, I think they have done a tr uh, tremendous work. Um, I've been a big fan for, for a while and, and, and so have some of the participants that you'll hear from in just a minute. Um, and they deserve a shout out. Uh, and the only other thing that I'll say before we start is um, talking through issues of race and inclusion and Brad Wilcox and everything else um, kind of pits people in, in different I guess the way that I would say this is I don't want people feeling like they have to choose between um, their church and sticking up for their friends of, um, of other backgrounds. And I think, you know, it's very likely that we got something wrong in this podcast, that we said something. And we are a group. What I asked my, my friends to, to think of is, you know, treat yourself, treat yourself as though we're in a group of friends and we're trying to understand each other. Um, and that it's okay to make mistakes and that we're all trying. And I think it actually came off really well because of that. And that may mean that we need some grace on this stuff too. Um, but I think that the earnestness with which we are trying dispels some of the problem, right? It, it makes it a little bit easier because you can tell that we're, we're trying. So with that, I will let you get to uh, the discussion and uh, I will be back right at the very end just to share one other th thought with you real quick.
Hi, everybody. Welcome to Radical Civility. My name is Ben Piccini. Radical Civility is a project of Public Square Magazine, and I am excited tonight to have some good friends with me. Um, so recently in the news, Brad Wilcox, who is the second counselor in the General Young Men's Presidency, um, said some things in a, in a recorded Zoom session at a fireside that have caused a fair amount of um, controversy. And uh, we felt like it would be worthwhile to, to get a group together to, to parse this out. And uh, a couple of things before we begin here. First, our goal is to present a, an orthodox view, um, to be a group of people. Hey, run into the other room with mama, okay? My kids are still attacking me. Um, hi, buddy. Go, go get mama real quick. Love you. Um, our goal is to try our best. <laughs> he said, yay. <laughs> Um, I was going to say, I, can, I heard yay. He got very excited when I said the word mama. Um, our goal tonight is not to answer every question. Our goal is not to be apologists, right? Our goal is very, very simply to, to show what it feels like to be a faithful member who loves the church, who loves per, probably Brad Wilcox, and also to be really honest about kind of how we're feeling. Um, and I think that that's a good and noble goal and that it's worthwhile. If you're super... Um, if you're super frustrated right now, that's okay. Um, this may not be the place that gives you the most balm. Hopefully there's some, because we probably are feeling some of the same things. If you're looking for a big, strong, rousing defense where we say Brad Wilcox, you know, bench presses Satan in his sleep. This is probably also not the place where you're going to, to feel that. Our goal is a little bit different. It's to calm things down, to cool things down, um, and to look at this with a, a view of thoughtfulness. So with that, uh, I already know all of these fabulous folks, but I'm realizing that a lot of you don't. So I'm gonna give them just a, a couple of seconds to introduce themselves. And then we'll talk about kind of, well, why don't we just start with introductions and then we'll go from there. So I'm Ben Piccini, I think folks know me. Daniel, why don't we start with you? And then we'll go Megan, Jeff, Mosiah, and Jason. Sure, I'm Daniel Ortner. I am an, a, a, an attorney, a constitutional lawyer. Uh, I. I uh, am uh, a convert to the church, uh, raised in a Jewish Jewish background, and uh, so, and yeah, happy to be part of the discussion. Happy to have you. Megan. Um, I've been on before, but I'm Megan Kohler. I am a stay-at-home mom. I am also a convert. I joined the church um, as a teenager, and I have no idea <laughs> what I'm going to say tonight. I really mostly came because um, the voices that you had put together, Ben, sounded really interesting. And I, I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody else has to say. Appreciate it. We're glad you're here. Jeff Benyon. Um, so uh, my name is Jeff Benyon. I am a uh, uh, lifelong church member, uh, French speaker, fellow Francophile to Megan here founder, uh, co-founder of North Star International, which is a Latter-day Saint-focused organization for people dealing with uh, issues around sexuality and gender uh, from a faith perspective, uh, Orthodox faith perspective. And then um, I'm also a part-time marriage and family therapist and a full-time uh, real estate uh, property manager and finance guy. So fantastic. Wonderful to have you. Mosiah. So my name is Mosiah Olvera. I am a law student at the University of Tulsa College of Law. So Daniel, I need to talk to you. Uh, but I am focusing on immigration and constitutional law, criminal law, and I am also a lifelong member originally from Mexico. So that's me in a nutshell. Wonderful, Mosiah. It's wonderful to have you. Jason. Hi, I'm Jason Walker. I live outside Little Rock, Arkansas uh, with the Air Force and been here for a few months. I've uh, been a lifelong member of the church. Had my parents joined over 40 years ago. Uh, my father's black and mother's white. And so they joined shortly after the official declaration too. Uh, and so we've had a lot of discussion over years about that topic and, and the priesthood. Uh, and so I also was uh, Ben's mission companion in Houston. So also some history on this topic and getting to teach down there and, and uh, meet some great people. So I look forward to, to talking with him tonight. Well, Jason taught me everything I knew. Um, my, my mistakes were not his, but all the good things I did. He was my trainer. And uh, You look pretty young, Ben, but Jason looks even younger. So is it all that righteous <laughs> living or is it the little rock air? I don't know. Well, lots of water, lots of laughter. So. <laughs> 
Well, it is wonderful to have all of you. And I, I want to start by saying two things that, uh, that, I'm, that are um, really important to me. Um, we're going to talk as friends tonight. Um, I tried to reach out to a good group of my friends, people that I trust and care about. Um, my goal here tonight was not to um, tokenize anybody or to, to include somebody because of their background or anything like that, to cultivate instead just a group of people that I trust and care about from a lot of different perspectives. Um, and as part of that, nobody represents any voice other than their own. Um, these are people that I trust individually, and I think that that's a really important, I've, I've been thinking a lot about this old idea of liberalism, right, and it's about the ideas and the individual and, and that kind of a thing. And that doesn't mean we don't have group status or, or anything like that, but it's something that I want to make sure is really clear, um, is that everybody is here because I know them and I trust them and I, I have a relationship with them. I'm actually reading a really interesting book right now called The Beautiful Community, and uh, he talks about, um, specifically in the book, um, this idea of uh, colorblind casting. So in the original Star Wars movie, there, was, there were no black people. And so in the next one, they made sure that Billy Dee Williams was in there. And it was very obvious to most people that it could have been written for anybody and they just needed to make sure they had more diversity in the cast. Um, and somebody else commented on this and said, um, I'm very grateful that my producer wrote a part specifically for me, not because of my color, not because of my race, not because of anything else, but because I could speak for myself. And I thought that was a really, really cool idea. So um, with that, I'd like to kick it off. Um, I, I don't think that we're gonna spend the whole time focused on this, but uh, what were your initial impressions when you heard about um, what was going on with, um, with Brad Wilcox? When you saw this, what were kind of your first takeaways? And in particular, why, you know, I, and I want to make sure that there's space for this. One of the first things that I felt was a, a desire to defend Brad Wilcox. I love him. He's changed my life in some ways, and I'm going to talk about that. Um, and I also was very careful to resist that temptation because I think it can lead to some bad places. So what was your first impression? What did you do with it? How did you grapple with it? Because I think you're all thoughtful people that have tried to work their way through this deliberately. And not everyone needs to, to, to jump into the, to these questions. If you feel like you have something to say, then jump in. But if you don't, that's okay too. Why might people be feeling pain about this? I guess I'll go. <laughs> so the way I found out about this was through a friend who I work really closely with on in law school. And his wife is a uh, member who's no longer attending and he is not a member. And he just said, hey, what do you think about what Brad Wilcox said? And I said, well, he has said a lot of things. <laughs> so what did he say that you're interested in? And it was like, well, he said this about uh, Blacks and I, I looked it up and uh, just to get context of what he was talking about. And sure enough, yeah, he, he, he said those things. And uh, then my friend told me, but he apologized. So just, just, you know, just so you know, I'm not leaving that out. And my initial reaction to that was, oh, wow. Well, he had up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like that's, I think it just, I think my initial reaction was like, wow. Okay. Well, goes to prove that our church leaders are fallible and that we don't have the doctrine of infallibility in our church and that was exactly the first reaction that I told him and he said oh so you feel like it actually just goes to prove your point of that your church makes that church leaders are not perfect and I was like yeah exactly it's like, okay so that was my initial reaction I think that's that's uh, not an, an uncommon take and I think that that makes a lot of sense. Other other people's reactions. I can say, I mean, for me, the first thing I wanted to do was listen to the whole talk that he gave. And I, I did that. Um, I, I felt uh, bad doing so because I had to go to um, John John Dalen's uh, Facebook or uh, YouTube channel to to listen to it and later found it on the, the stakes page and listened to it on there as well. But um, I wanted to listen to the whole thing. And I, I think, in, you know, in some ways, the, the whole context, it, it, it does provide some context to the remarks that in some ways can be seen as helpful. On the other hand, I think it, it raised to me some other problems with just the overall tone of the, the remarks that I think fed into the, the part about race and, and priesthood restrictions and temple restrictions that it just felt like, for, it, it, I thought that the whole tone was a little too flippant a little, a little too sarcastic 
Um, and I think the, the, the audience was youth. And I think that's why Brad Wilcox is, is you know, he's one of the reasons he's so popular is his appeal and the, the rhetoric he uses. And he's just very accessible and, and real in the way he talks about things with, with youth. But I think in this case, when talking about really difficult topics, it wasn't maybe the right approach to, to have that, that, that tone. And, and so that, that was really what stood out to me the most, listening to the whole, the whole remarks and, and this priesthood comments in, in context of the whole remarks, which just the overall tone was, was, was just not, not the right tone for the message that he was talking about for about these difficult issues. So I'm hearing from Mosiah, it was like the content and Daniel, you're mentioning the tone that it felt a little bit dismissive. Megan? Um, I, um, I don't have a lot of experience with Brad Wilcox. I've heard people talk about him, you know, for years and I've never, um, really gotten around to listening to his stuff. Um, other than that, that kind of seminal BYU speech that he gave, um, several years back, but, um, I, I also would say that my, it seems to me like um, there were, I, I listened to a lot of his remarks as well. And, and there were a lot of points that I, that I think he was intending to make that really resonated that I thought were good principles. But I also, I also can see why people would feel like legitimate concerns had been dismissed. And I, I think maybe that's, what's got a lot of people's hackles up maybe not as in some instances the content of what he said but I think if he had used a more sensitive tone um, I think that we would be seeing a lot less of that um, a lot less of the pushback um, and so I, I think that it's important that you you don't spend your remarks trying to respond to your critics um, when you have, when you have an audience in the church like that, you, you want to spend your time testifying of Christ, um, putting forth the good things. And I, and I think he was trying to do that, but I think that some of the ways that he did it appear to me to be engaging a little bit in the culture war. And, um, that's, probably not what we want to do when we have a church audience so very good jeff or, or jason do either of you have a thought uh i i can jump in here i guess um uh, i've got uh peter open here uh but sanctify the lord god in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Uh, and uh, our Greek scholars among us know that, that that reason, the reason of the hope, that word reason in Greek is ap apologia. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, uh, which is what we get uh, the term apologetics for. Uh, and I, I, I am a huge Brad Wilcox fan. I've met him a couple times. He is someone who deeply cares uh, about people. Uh, and and I, I really, on a personal level, I really admire his enthusiasm and love for the gospel. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I wish I had that as much as he did sometimes. Uh, and he strikes me as someone who is always ready to give a reason for hope. Uh, and so I just I just want to say I, I I have a massive admiration for him, and uh, and his his uh, zeal and and uh, ability to to give those reasons. I know apologetics can have a bad word, but uh, it's not bad in Peter's book here. Um, <clears throat> so if I th I think about this, though uh, I don't disagree with anything Megan or Daniel or Mosiah said at all, uh, but. Uh, I, I've been thinking about this as I've been looking at the reactions. I think we've got some different groups here. I think the first group that I hope we spend uh, maybe the most time on uh, is there are people who are dealing with hurt and they they felt exclusion. They felt a marginalization. They felt, uh, you know, they've maybe personally struggled 
with uh, the 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 issue about the priesthood ban. Uh, or, but but I think even deeper than that, they've they personally, you know, had a comment or something said to them, you know, or felt less than in the church, and so for them, this is kind of triggered. And I don't mean that in a flippant way. You know, th this has brought up uh, some pain, okay? And and so I, I hope we can come back to, to how we can help with that because I think that's the most fruitful area uh, of where we can truly be uh, uh, Christ Christ uh, emissaries here. Next, we have, um, you mentioned John Dolin then, uh, or, and I think uh, this was publicized by him. I, uh, this is not someone who is, you know, I, that I'm sorry to say, uh, but my sense is that's not a person who's a good faith actor. It's not someone who's interested in, uh, you know, um, helping people in the church feel better. He's not someone who's interested uh, in, in creating unity and harmony and, and those sorts of things. So, so we do have some people exploiting this issue. Uh, but I, again, I don't want to, I, I want to make sure you're all clear. My categories are different here, right? This isn't everybody, but this is a, a, a certain segment is exploiting this issue for division, for hate, for furthering bitterness and so forth. And then we have um, <clears throat> the uh, a kind of a third group, uh, which is the, the people that are on social media, the doom scrolling and those people who, uh, and I'm going to sound a little critical here too, but, you know, Timothy talks about them uh, as having itching ears and being cast about with every wind of doctrine. Uh, and I think uh, th there's a certain person who is unrooted uh, and uh, is kind of tossed about with the controversies of the day. And they, they can get riled up uh, in something. And these people are going to forget about this in a week. There's going to be another controversy. There's going to be another outrage. And, and it's going to be, it, we're just going to get tossed, tossed about with that. And so I think there's some ministry to these people too, but it's going to look a little different than the first group, which with these people, we want to help get them rooted in maybe some more timeless uh, things. Anyway, those were my thoughts. No, I very much, I can, sorry, go ahead, Megan. Sorry, um, I just, you know, as you were talking, Jeff, another group came to my mind that might be worth mentioning. And I think that this is the group that Brother Wilcox was trying to talk to. Um, even, you know, if we have, um, if, if we have problems with his delivery or something. Um, but this is another group of people that I think also are struggling. And that's, People, especially youth, who hear all of the shrill voices out there who are constantly decrying um, the church and accusing it. And those kids have needs too. Yes. And they, they have to face those pressures um, and those shrill, shrill voices all of the time. I'm not saying that there are, that, that, I, I want to be clear that I think that there are people with legitimate concerns who are coming from a place of sincerity and we want to be compassionate towards them. But I think that Brother Wilcox's remarks, maybe he got too animated, but I think he was trying to help these kids to know that, that their difficulties um, matter too. That when they're feeling confused, and overwhelmed by all of the loud voices on social media, um, that the brethren are aware of that too, that he's aware of that and that the Lord is aware of that. I think that's, that's, uh, it's one that's been on my mind. Um, and to be clear, there are people who are acting in earnest who don't like the church much. Um, there are also some people, as was mentioned earlier, who are not good faith actors, who I struggle with. And I see our young people who are struggling with that. And it's very hard for me. So the frustration I can is one thing that I can empathize with. Jason, did you want to say, add something real quick? Um, a lot of great things said about uh, people trying to reach. And I think context is really one of the big themes that comes up. Uh, I had the same reaction too. I, I love Brad Wilcox's talk. I love that he is very accessible. In fact, last week we used his talk um, uh, 
Worthiness is not flawlessness for the youth, actually. And we had a great time teaching it. And I really appreciate that he acknowledges the challenges that the generation faces and he tries to interact with them. Uh, another talk was brought up, uh, the one on grace, which is a fantastic talk because grace is such a powerful aspect of the gospel. And uh, I'll, I'll say this myself, I'm not sure I've understood it properly over my years. And I, if I can even go on a limb, I'd say, I don't think we as a church maybe have <laughs> properly understood grace and taught it. And so I, I really like how he's broken that down. Um, so I wanted to defend him at two first, but then I went and I read the comments and uh, I didn't get to watch the entire talk, but I did watch that segment. And uh, to be blunt, he, he messed up. Um, his comment, I see where he was coming from. His larger context was to the youth of, you know, why were these blessings uh, denied to people? One point that was brought up was that, uh, you know, he was historically inaccurate, that it wasn't denied to the Blacks until 1978, which is correct. Uh, people mentioned Elijah Abel. And so really when the priesthood was restored in 1829, it was restored to everyone. There were no restrictions. Uh, and so I, I think that that lack of historical context also allowed some of the bandwagon to jump on. And, uh, you know, I think the concern that it, it was dismissive is legitimate. Uh, I could see how people felt that way. And when I read the comments, I, I, it was kind of kind of cringy. I love Brother Wilcox, but uh, as someone who's you know read this topic and and uh, you know studied it and, and has some family connection to it, when you're going to deal with official declaration two, you've got to be really careful in that you either need to really build up the context and be very clear, um, or you need to just briefly mention it. But it, it, it just it gets really uh, really sticky quickly particularly talking about the reason, you know, I know we're not going to discuss the root cause, but every discussion of root cause is a perhaps, right? You know, the church has rightfully disavowed some of the years that, well, perhaps uh, those who were black were unfaithful in the, in the premoral existence or the corollary, or perhaps the white members of the church were not ready. Those are all perhaps. They're all hypotheticals and they really don't do us a whole lot of good. That's not to dismiss them. They're, they're good thought discussions just to why, well, why was it, why were people tonight? Why did Brigham Young enact that policy? Why did so many prophets support it? I don't know. Why did it take so long? I don't know. But, uh, and I think it's good to, you know, when we were teaching in Houston, Ben and I, we met people that uh, had those questions and we discussed them and we didn't have great answers. But the question that I ask now is what does the priesthood and the gospel do for a person of color? Uh, so my father served as a bishop several years ago uh, in, in a, a mostly white ward. And so it's, the gospel allows everyone to serve. Um, it also eternally, what's it promised everyone, regardless of color or gender, it promises them you know, eternal life if they were willing to, to follow the teachings of Christ. And so, uh, yeah, it was a policy that, for my personal opinion, it seemed pretty unfair. I don't understand it. Uh, I don't know why it was in, uh, but it has changed. Uh, and this is not be dismissive, but it's also, it ended almost 50 years ago, 45 years ago. It, it's been a while. The church is not perfect. We've hit that. And uh, it's, it's good to look back sometimes and discuss, but it's also not good to try and drive staring the rearview mirror. Uh, and I think there's, there's ways to make progress. Um, and so that's what, what I thought as I read his comments. I, I appreciate the fact that he apologized. And I, you know, a lot of his talks are about grace. And I think this is a time when you know, Brother Wilcox might need some grace from us, does need some grace from us. That he made a comment that was not well thought out. We all do that sometimes. Uh, and also too, in the era we live in, you know, we're all on Zoom right now. Um, you have to be cognizant of how you're presenting things as, as uh, Jeff and Megan and others have presented very well. And you don't want to be disingenuous, right? It's Heisenberg principle, just the observation of a subject changes its behavior. You still want to be genuine, real, but also to recognize that unlike when we were growing up, when you gave a fireside talk, it stayed in the stake center, stayed in the building. Now it goes out to the entire planet. And so you be very cognizant of how you present. He didn't present anything, you know, when talked about the other churches. Yeah, we do believe we are the true church. Uh, we only have the authority. However, again, that tone does matter a lot, uh, as Elizabeth said. So uh, I think there's a lot of good lessons to be learned from it. I, I look forward to hearing other talks from Brother Wilcox in the future and hearing how he learns from this. So I think it's, if we treat it properly, it's, it's a great learning opportunity. What a, what a great perspective. So when I first heard this, um, I was heart sick. Um, pretty frustrated because I knew, I knew of, ex of specific people who would be really hurt by this, um, who are already going through a hard time, and this is not what they were aiming to hear. I also love Brad Wilcox. I think his talks are wonderful. I think he, you know, I, I don't know him except through general conference talks, right? Like and 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 online clips. I've never met him before, so I don't know. Um, but his talk on grace 
absolutely changed my, um, a friend of mine put it this way. He said, there's been a renaissance in soteriology because of one man. I didn't even know what soteriology was. It's the doctrine of salvation, right? And where that comes from. That one man has kind of started this new discussion on, um, <laughs> so just so everybody knows in the chat, there's a conversation about how I should just shut up and we can be done now that Jason said what he said, because it was so on the nose, perfect. And we have nothing left to talk about, but I will keep going and ruin that special moment. Um, because I, I think they're right. Um, Brother Wilcox is somebody who has affected me in, in personal ways because of his remarks. Um, his talk on grace is one of the clearest, it's actually required reading in one of my classes because it is so, so, um, such a good way, an articula a good, simple articulation of what we believe about, about Jesus Christ and grace and what it means for us as, as Christians. Um, so I was heart sick and I was frustrated. Um, one thing that I have learned and I have not always done very well at, but I try, is that I never tell people, here's why you, you don't need to worry about this concern that you have. Instead, I say, here's what works for me, and it's okay if it doesn't work for you. Because I may not have the thing that works for you, and that's okay. But I can tell you what works for me. And I think that having that little bit of humility can be a, a lot more useful. Unfortunately, when, I'm, when you're around youth, you want to like make it funny and smack down the, the other side and, and you know all of those things. And I think that's the real risk is that actually that that doesn't work for, for adults. I'm not sure that it always works for youth either. Um, and I think that that's, that's important. Jeff, were you gonna jump in? Well, uh, yeah, I, I just uh, uh, to pick up on that, you know, uh, uh, my friend, Hannah, our, our friend, Hannah, a lot of us know Hannah Syriac, uh, I'm a, I love her. And she was reminding us, me today of, uh, so you know, accountability, so there's some voices out there calling for accountability for Brother Wilcox, right? And I think some of them want him fired from BYU. They want him uh, out of the young men's presidency. Uh, but, but it's interesting to think about, you know, what, what do we mean by accountability and what is accountability? And Hannah reminded me of this idea about calling in because we say, oh, I'm, I'm calling you out, right? And what that means a very public uh, recounting. Well, what did Jesus say? He said, if thy brother hath aught against thee, take it between he and thee. Uh, and then if you can't work it out, do it. And, and that's certainly, uh, now maybe these people don't have access to him or maybe they tried that. So I, I don't wanna write that off, but, but certainly I think the most fruitful way, because accountability in my book, doesn't especially we were talking about grace. I, I don't want him fired. I don't I don't want him to resign because he's a blessing and gift to the church. Uh, it's not my call, so whatever. But um, I do think what what I think accountability here is growth, right? And and learning. And you don't get to do that if you're getting called out on social media, right? And people braying for your head. Uh, the best, most impactful things where that's happened to me, uh, and I've, I'm, I've sucked my foot in my mouth way more than I think Brother Wilcox ever has. So I, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, but, and when I do that, you know, it, it's so helpful to me if someone takes me aside and says, you know, Jeff, when you said this, uh, you know, it, it hurt me or I did this, right? Uh, then I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. How can I make it right? Oh, oh, I never realized, you know, or wow, you know, and I so appreciate that. On the other hand, when people are wishing me to die or uh, my wife to leave me or various other things that you read about me online, that really doesn't make me want to do anything. You know, that doesn't make me change. Uh, and so I think that, uh, that's a, it's not going to be a terribly productive conversation if we're calling people out. But if we call people in and bring them in and say, okay, you know, here's, here's how it is, that's going to be so much better. I think that's a, that's a wonderful point. Hannah told me that too. And I think a lot of people who are calling for accountability, there, there are two things that come to my mind. First, there are a group of people, and I think you articulated this well before, there are a group of people out there who aren't actually interested in us improving or doing better or Brad Wilcox. They will take literally any chance to kick the church. Um, and I think we just can be honest about that. 
At the same time, the best response to those folks is to take it seriously and to try our very best to live up to the very best that we can. Um, I have made a promise not to critique my church leaders and I try really hard to hold to that. And I have never been more grateful for that promise that I've made than in the last couple of weeks to see the amount of anger and vitriol and contention. And that doesn't mean that my eyes are closed. My mouth is closed. Those two things are different, right? Um, and there are absolutely things, you know, at the, at the ward level or the stake level, I do call my, my leaders and I say, hey, I didn't like what you said and I'd like to talk to you about it. Um, but looking at the amount of anger, the, the scriptures talk about how in the last days, men, men's hearts will be stirred up unto anger. Um, it seems to me right now that there are certain voices that are convinced that the best thing they can do um, is be the most upset about something bad that happens. And it just strikes me as that is, that is not, in fact, the most useful thing. Um, to me, the most useful thing is pulling somebody to the side and saying, like, you know, I really am not okay with that. Or, or you know, showing some... Show, people have talked a lot about grace, and I, I need to distinguish here. Grace, yes, but it can't be cheap grace, right? And I understand that people want there to be some real, you know, something real there. But I, I think that that's, that's important. Jeff was talking, and I just kept thinking, this, is, this has to be about growth mindset right? This has to be about letting people have another chance to try and do better. And, and, and by the way, if not, the policy will be don't go on Zoom. Don't go in bug, big audiences. Here are three things. Have four, five people review your remarks before you give them. It yeah. won't actually give us a chance to have conversations that are really needed and meaningful. Don't say anything right. authentic. Like, that's don't, right. Don't, that's right. Don't and I don't think that's a that, win. Yeah. I, I think it was one of you and I can't, I, I won't put words in your mouth. If it was one of you, you can tell me, but I can't remember. We were talking about <laughs> Whoopi Goldberg and I, I'm not defending her comments at all, but I also feel like yeah, this is, this is what a talk show is for, for somebody to say, what you just said outrages me. And I want to tell you why. And I want to tell you why I think it was so wrong. And I want to push you on that. Um, I think that's, that's something that we need. We, we need to have that's, that's valuable. Uh, Mosiah, you ready? Go. So I kind of want to disagree a little bit with y'all on this. So I'm going to push back just on, on, on the way I think. I don't think I disagree with anything that has been said factually, right? Like, I don't think you're wrong, you know? I think the way we're approaching it is wrong. And I think we're having a conversation about how people are reacting when it's not really our place to tell people how to react, if that makes sense. So I think telling someone what to think of accountability of Brad Wilcox will actually not, not really diffuse the situation at, at all. Um, I've, I've never seen, um, so for example, I've never seen someone who, someone says something racist or that is like really, really bad. And then the person who was mad, if that person then is told, hey, like, that person apologized so just you know like we should come from a point of like you should just like forgive and you know like that just starts to put the burden on that person when really with the conversation that person wanted to have is about how wrong it was and how angry it made it made them and I think yeah, there's a place and time for the comment to be made like hey like you know what like I think it it helped me like I think what you said Ben was really helpful to me where you said I tell you what works for me and it might not work for you, but, but it worked for me. And out of a, out of an, a desire to help that person come to have some closure or just kind of have some ball in life. I like that phrase, but I always get really worried when we go down this, 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 I guess, path of criticizing the reaction, because I think it's, it's, it's obvious. It's, it's obvious that there's enemies of the church out there. That's, I don't, I don't <laughs> that's most definitely obvious and clear, but I think, I think people should not feel, I don't think we have to justify the reaction. I think also though, we should take care of when we are going to tell them that they need to do better. Um, so that's the only thing, I don't think anybody did that but that's what just made me put to me on pins and needles a little bit. Like, I feel like I'm, well, I think we're walking on eggshells here. Um, but just a couple other things I just kind of wanted to talk about as well is that as part of this, so sorry if we veer off the, so someone can respond to my stuff too. No, you go right ahead. Um, I feel like there's something we haven't hit on that is part of this is that there's a culture in the church of fear, frustration, and doubt. So when someone is asked a very hard doctrinal question like race and the priesthood, there's fear, 
that, oh shoot, this person's going to attack my religion or they're going to say something bad. There's frustration, like, why are we talking about this again? Like, gosh, dang it. Like, don't you know we resolved it already? Um, and then there's like doubt, like, well, I don't really know what the answer is. And <laughs> what if I give them an answer? And they're like, well, that's not real or that can't be it. Um, and then that just, I feel like that's a cocktail for horrible answers. And the scriptures say, you know, perfect love casts out fear. Um, so then you forget the love part <laughs> and then you're going to have a like, 100% guaranteed horrible answer. Um, and I think like as well, like in terms of the accountability, I think uh, someone said, I can't remember if it was Jeff, but I, but I think it hit the point where like, what is the purpose of the church? Like the purpose of the church isn't necessarily to make you a good person. The purpose of the church is to help you reach exaltation. And by nature of the process, you will become a good or decent person. But for us to be surprised that there is an indecent thing said or an of not very decent person in the church, especially even in the leadership, shouldn't come as a surprise. Um, Cause that's why they're probably there. That's actually probably how Brad Wilcox came to have such a powerful testimony of flawlessness is not, you know, uh, worthiness because <laughs> how else could you do that other than having flaws yourself? And then I think the other thing is like the question I think people should ask themselves, well, like, is the apology that he gave enough? I think that's how you can judge for yourself whether your reaction is justified. And I think the answer that everyone should come to the conclusion is, I think, sincerely, yes. I, he said, I made a mistake. And he didn't say, I made a little mistake or I I made a mistake only in saying this. He, he simply just left it. I'm, I made a mistake. So I don't know what else you could ask from a person, but feel free to, to keep asking. No, I I, I love good, the perspective. Good. I want to fight you on that in a second. Jason, go ahead. I love what Mosiah said there. Um, you know, first when it, when it occurred, I thought, you know, this era of cancel culture, to use a current buzz term, I thought, okay, I don't want him released or fired. And I thought, oh, he, well, but maybe he probably should be the next person to go help visit the NAACP. But then I thought, maybe he should be. Maybe he should go with President Nelson, one of the 12, and go and talk with them. You know, and uh, whether it's to learn from their perspective or, you know, um, I don't know if it's a pause, but just to go and talk with them and see, you know, what did they think of that? And I think it'd be a great opportunity, uh, as long as it's genuine, to go and say, hey, I did mess up, and I'd like to hear your perspective about it. Um, so I think there is an opportunity to, to show that growth there that Mosiah talks about. And I'd like to hear, uh, point, Mosiah, thanks for bringing it back. We were discussing the reactions, and there is a, I think there's a value in drawing the measurement of how we'll respond as a church and the people. Um, but we're here talking because you know we admitted at the beginning that people are rightfully offended and and have some reason to you know, to be concerned to to feel dismissed. So thanks for bringing that up. Well, and and I want to emphasize, like Brad Wilcox apologized, I think for a reason. I see a few people on Twitter who are trying this like Brad Wilcox did nothing wrong thing, and it's like no, but he said he did something wrong, and I think he knew he did. And by the way, I I was even frustrated that he said, yeah, last night I said something I shouldn't have there's now evidence he's been saying this for quite a while. Like it wasn't just last night. There's some things that I, I, I think this is, when I first heard this, my first reaction was go, to go into defensive mode. And I always try and take three or four days. Let me just calm down for a minute and see what's actually being said. And I, there was even somebody on Twitter asking me to, you know, you need to say something and something like that. And I was like, yeah, I need to think first. Okay. I need to breathe for a second. President Hinckley once gave a talk in which he described somebody that he admired. He said he was always so deliberate. I've never heard that as a compliment before. And I, I decided I was going to do two things. I was going to be deliberate and I was going to look up what deliberate meant in the dictionary first, right? Because um, I, I, I didn't know. And all it means is measured and careful and thoughtful. I think if we are digging in our heels and saying Brad Wilcox is amazing, that actually, I felt heart sick about this until I had the impression of how can we turn this into a good thing? How can we take this negative and turn it into a positive? Daniel, go ahead. Just, just a brief comment on what you just said, really brief comment. Uh, I think what, it's so important to, to be measured in our reaction because I think that invites the one-on-one -on -one conversations with people um, where they feel they can talk to us, where we're not going to just be dismissive. I think if we take a really hard stance and say like, Brad Wilcox is 100% right and there's no room for criticizing him, um, that that cuts off conversations, which I, I think you mentioned really well, then is that's how change happens. It, that's how people actually make progress is these one-on-one -on -one conversations that are meaningful. Like you're not going to get a lot of progress in a Facebook chat or a you know, Facebook post with our Twitter thread with, with 
people responding in mass like it's this one-on-one -on -one meaningful conversations where you listen to each other that's where actual progress happens and i think you, like measuring having a measured response and nuance and being empathetic is, is the way we get those conversations and those relationships in the first completely place. agree let, let me just yeah. i i think megan is coming up next let me just say one thing and then i'll, I'll jump to you I, dan ellsworth is, is a buddy of mine we, we recently did an episode together on liberal and conservative religion and i it may have been you jeff i can't actually remember who it was but somebody just said i admire my friends on the left because they have a utopian desire and an impatience for a better world. I thought that was one of the most generous statements um, of somebody who I don't always agree with, the people on the left. I've, I've really tried to be generous in my assessment of my friends on the left in, in this cir circumstance. Nephi says that he, he oh, oh God, make me that I might shake at the si very sight of sin, right? Uh, it can be hard for me sometimes because I think some of my friends on the left are not always good actors or you know whatever it may be. And yet at the same time, so Daniel's right. I think that one-on-one -on -one conversations are better. And at the same time, one of the things that I've, I taught my middle school students was if somebody says something racist, you need to, you need to address that. And you may need to address it in front of everybody, right? And so I, I, I think that we need to be very careful that we don't start getting our high off of that you know, indignation or, or, or something like that. But is there an obligation? I think, I think that that's, a, that's an important thing that a, a good person is going to have to grapple with. And we're going to come down on that in different places, and that's okay. Megan, go ahead. I've, I've talked too much. Um, no, uh, just kind of um, some, to go along with what Daniel said, um, um, and, and what Messiah said too, that, let, okay, so let's pretend for a moment that everybody's um, reactions to this are just completely overblown. They're totally overwrought, and they, they have nothing to be offended about. You know, I and I'm not saying that that's the case at all, but even assuming that, um, I think our question should be, how how do we minister to these people? Then, um, how how do we touch their hearts, um, even if they're wrong? And usually, in the process of asking those questions, we come to see things a little bit more from their perspective, anyway. But I also think that having a measured reaction that also allows the spirit of the lord to be present which is huge when when something hurts me or offends me um even if i think that there's legitimate reason to be offended by taking that pause and imagining for a moment that god might have something to offer me even if the other person was trying to hurt me that he still might be able to use this as a teaching opportunity for me that I can't have those moments if I just shoot out of the gate guns blazing. Um, and I'm certainly not going to be able to connect with any people on the other side of the issue if I do that. So I, I, I do think, um, you know, there, that, <laughs> that there is something to be said about um, not, not just going with your instinctive reaction and, and giving it a minute and maybe letting the Lord tutor you a little bit and also letting your heart soften for a minute before you, you go out and start engaging with people on these, on these issues. When I was a middle school assistant principal, my rule of thumb was um, if I can't feel compassion and charity towards the student that is about to get disciplined by me, then I'm not ready to discipline them. By the way, I was not always perfect at that. Some of my students really made me mad. Um, so I'm not pretending that I was always there, but I think it was a really good rule that I wish I had kept to a little bit more of the time. I wanna start pushing in this direction because I think it's a really good um, direction to go in, which is how do we turn this negative into a positive? And I think one thing that I feel totally comfortable with is actually, um, I I'll start with an example. I want, I want you all to start thinking about that too, but how can we take this thing that has happened, that's caused a lot of pain and spin it, not spin it, but really try to make of it something beneficial. Um, I recently actually wrote a piece on anti-racism and this timing is, is, is uh, interesting to say the least. I think this is an opportunity for me to talk to my kids about some stuff. I think this is an opportunity for me to, um, to do some things in my personal life that could help, um, to have some conversations with students about, about some things. One thing that I think is so easy and doesn't cost me anything is to emphasize the things that the church has, has moved away from, that it no longer supports in any way as doctrine. Um, the race and the priesthood essay about valiance in the pre in, in the in the premortal life. That's something that we can hit really hard now. 
because it's not a part of our doctrine. And that's, that feels really good to me. Um, a lot of the lineage of Cain stuff, I think, I think Jason said before, but there's a lot of stuff we don't know and it's okay to say that. Now, let me add to that one thing. Um, I think it is true that there are a lot of things we don't know. I'm going to, this is only my opinion. And again, I'm not criticizing the church. I'm not criticizing leaders or, or doctrine, but I, I want to say there are some things we do know, right? And one of them is that Brigham Young had some weird, let me, let me be a little bit more blunt, had some really bad racist ideas, right? I, I am very comfortable with that. And if that's where this came from, I think that that's the kind of thing that I'm looking at and going, that doesn't cost like that. I, I would rather it not be that way because I want to, um, I love Brigham Young and he was a prophet and all of those things and that's fine. And at the end of the day, I think there are a lot of people who are looking at this and going, but like, we do know some stuff about this. And we know that Brigham Young had some bad ideas. I certainly don't think that that makes them try, they're not trying to attack the church or tear us down. Um, I think that they're looking at it and seeing something that's pretty obvious. Um, and at the same time, there are a lot of people who love the institution and love Brigham Young and aren't quite ready to go to that place yet. I, th I think having that conversation is, is, is healthy um, and getting to a place where we can muddle through that kind of thing. Um, you know, a student came to me and asked me the other day and it was, it was private. And, and she said, so what, what do you think this was? And I said, well, I mean, well, and she said, let me guess, we don't know everything. Right. And I said, well, we do though. Like we have testimony of Brigham Young when he was on the, on the legislature floor talking about, you know, the different races and, you know, he had some really paternalistic views and I think it's okay to admit to those things too. Um, and that doesn't mean that everything has to be hunky dory all the time. I think that that's required of somebody who's, who's trying to be intellectually honest. Um, Brad Wilcox also made a point about how the priesthood has always been exclusive. Quick, ben, like, ben, yeah, ben, please ben, go ben, ahead, Jason. To build on that point. Uh, Cause one thing that, I, that tells me, at least when I've looked at this is the Lord takes us as we are. And we look at the members of the church in the early 19th century and the society they grew up in. And it's not an excuse, but you consider what was the general attitude and, in many ways, Brigham Young was a man of his time. Uh, take that how you will. And, you know, just as we see in the Old Testament, when the uh, Israelites wanted a king and the Lord did not want them to, he, he let them take a path that was not the best. That's not, now, to be very clear, that's not, this, I'm not saying that, uh, that's excuse me, the policy as it was uh, put in place. But my point is that I look at how the church was at that time and the people, and, and I, I wonder how much growth they had to make you know, from a society that was still openly endorsing slavery, uh, you know, where you had, obviously you were still what, um, you know, in the same time you still had 20 years of civil war, roughly 15 years of civil war. So you had, you had the society was still very much a, you know, a, a very racial, racist and racial society. Uh, so that's helped me a bit. Again, it doesn't excuse anything, but it, it does kind of put it into that great word context uh, that there was a lot of growth to be had. Yeah, and I understand the counter argument is, well, if you're the, you know, God's perfect church, the complete church, then why was God to be that way? I don't know, but again, I, I think that there was uh, some growth to be had, and uh, you know, there's uh, it's one of those things that I, I've accepted, um, and I look forward to a fuller answer. I think after this life, and in the meantime, I I do know that I've seen the gospel change lives, and I know it can do that, uh, and will do that going forward. And if I can, Ben, I just want to say something. I've I've heard Jason say several times in our conversation that he doesn't know. And I've actually been thinking a lot about the power of the phrase, I don't know, lately. And, re and um, I, in fact, I recently uh, reread President Corbett's essay. Um, it was released the same time as the Race and the Priesthood Gospel Topics essay. Um, and this was just a personal essay that he wrote at a time when he was a stake president. And for whatever reason, it's not shared as much as, as the Race and the Priesthood essay, but it's really, really good. And and to, to give a little bit of context for this, um, President Corbett is, you know, very smart <laughs> by, by both secular and sacred standards. He's, um, he's a trial attorney. Um, he, he is very, very aware of the, the church's history with race, of things that have been said by leaders in the past. Um, and I was so touched by his testimony that he gave where he said that he knew that the, that the revelation to lift the ban was, was of God. But he also said, I do not know why the ban was instated. And I, I think that that is so powerful and important because I, I think sometimes we, we wanna help people. And so we start um, 
trying to explain things. And I think that comes from a good, sincere desire to help people. But when, when Elder Corbett says that he doesn't know, I believe him. And I know that he's heard a lot of explanations for the priesthood ban. He tells us what he does know, but he's, he's open about what he doesn't. And I think that that allows, that gives space, like Jason was saying, for more answers to come in the future, for more of the Lord's purposes to be revealed. And I, and I, I worry sometimes that in our haste to provide answers, we, we may inadvertently cut people off from continuing to listen to what's coming. And if the things that I've heard spoken over the pulpit, you know, about, or, or, or that I've heard from President Corbett or from, from um, our church leaders recently, there's a lot coming still. <laughs> there's a lot coming. And I, I think it's, um, I, I think it's just important that we keep our hearts open and soft so that we can continue to see the Lord's glory be revealed. That's a brilliant thought. I, I saw Patrick Mason said something online that um, that really struck me. He was talking about the the parable of Jesus when he talks about how the house is swept and empty and the, and the bad evil spirits are driven out and it comes back and it sees that the house is swept and empty and there's no one in it anymore. And so he brings another seven evil spirits with him and it's, it's worse than it was before. So it's, it's an odd parable. It's not cited very often. And the basic idea is that sometimes you need to fill the void with something that is right and true and good, right? Um, I think in some ways, that's what I'm trying to aim for with this podcast is how can we turn the negative into a positive? I will also say for myself that as I look at some of the things that are going on with, you know, we had these oral traditions about lineage of Cain and, and, you know, I, I heard when I was growing up, well, you know, the priesthood was always really exclusive. It was one tribe of the tribe of Israel. These are the kinds of things that, and, and by the way, the priesthood was exclusive. I don't, I, I think that that's actually a valuable insight. I just think it's not a particularly valuable insight when it comes to blacks and the priesthood, because those two things were very different. Um, but um, I think one of the best, you know, things we can do is say, I don't know the full answer. And I'm really excited to get to that. I can turn to the Lord in faith and to the prophet and, and everything else and say, I want more revelation on this topic. And I'll, I'll be the first one to say, I don't know if Jason remembers, but we would talk a little bit about this when we were on the mission. Like, I, I feel like there is more behind this um, than currently meets the eye, that there's, there's a little bit more going on here. And I'm excited to see what all of that is. Um, Daniel, why don't we go to you next? I know uh, we've got a couple of people waiting. So Daniel, you're up. Well, I, I think just in your response to your last comment, I, I think that it, it's, you, I think you said earlier, like you offer ideas i i think that part of the problem with the way that brad wilcox's remarks maybe came across was he's very definitive about it like this is the answer like this is the one thing that you know, should give everyone listening comfort um and i think that you i think you're the one who said it earlier that um you know it, it helps to say that these are some possibilities that have helped me with the topic um doesn't i don't have all the answers i don't know everything um i, I think that pointing to the history of priesthood can be helpful in understanding the topic of priesthood and how it's distributed it's i don't think it's a full answer um i think because elijah abel was ordained to the priesthood early other early members of the church were ordained so it, i don't think it's a complete answer i think it's 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 limited but i don't think it's completely um should be off the table to discuss that the fact that you know, i'm jewish by my origin and you know my i have family um that are kohanim like uh, priestly lineage but i'm wouldn't be a Kohen because my uh, wrong side, like I, my, 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 my father's side had the Kohen line and not the mother's side or vice versa. I can't remember exactly how that works, but it was the wrong, wrong family line. You know, if it was the other side, I might've been a Kohen and I would have you know, been able to do certain, have certain responsibilities in the synagogue. Um, so I, I do think it's, it's, I mean, it is, I think the, the thing I did like about Brad, brother Wilcox's point was it is amazing that we have as much priesthood, uh, power and authority and access as we do on the earth today there's never been a time in the world where as much access and power uh, there's been as much access to the power of the priesthood so i think it, it, it's not a bad thing to say that and to celebrate that i think we can offer that as something that is helpful and then still say i but i don't know everything and i understand why this isn't fully satisfying or a, a complete answer 
Well, and it goes to a point that Patrick Mason has made lately, which is that we need every member of the church to be a theologian. We need to come up with ideas and try and figure this out. I actually think that that's exactly the problem here, actually. Exactly. Like, that's, that's what we're doing. <laughs> that's what got us in this trouble. <laughs> right. Like, actually, maybe we should cool our jets. And like, I actually think there's something really wise to saying, hey, let's let the, the general authorities do their job. And, and, and by the way, I think Patrick Mason is great. I love his, his book on peace. That's where, where he talks about this. Um, and by the way, I do some private theologizing, right? I, I do that in my journal sometimes. And I go, I wonder if this is how it really works. I am very uncomfortable. Uh, and always have been with kind of shooting from the hip doctrinally. It just, there's something about, and, and I'm sure that I still do it even, even still. Um, but that speculation, I think, can get us in some real trouble sometimes. All right, I think Jeff is next and then Mosiah. Uh, Mosiah, you go ahead. No, I, you, oh. you definitely were. Okay. Um, well, uh, a couple of things. Uh, as, as someone was saying today, uh, on Twitter, that the uh, fount of all wisdom and temperance and moderation, that the church just needs to come out and admit this was a mistake. Now, I'm, I'm uh, like you, Jason, I'm really open to that idea, right? That it was, you know, it was, it was, it was a, it was a, a personal animus that maybe got turned into, it got institutionalized and then through whatever process, right? Maybe, maybe that's what happened. On the other hand, uh, this person was saying, well, the church doesn't like to admit mistakes. And I actually want to push back on that. Uh, we've already admitted that some of the explanations we gave for this were erroneous. And uh, Benjamin, I wish they were all oral. You know, these were written down too. <laughs> um, and so, uh, but we have admitted, not beyond that, P President Nelson described our failure to emphasize the true name of the church as an error. He has called it from the pulpit an error. So it, at the very least, this president is not afraid to say it's an error. And maybe he will come out and say the priesthood ban was an error. But if, if he feels inspired and authorized to say that, I believe, and uh, he, he would do that, I think, because he's done it before. And But I'm not saying it wasn't an error, but, but we might be um that in some ways that might be too easy of an answer too so i i don't know i just don't want to get over our skis on this because uh they haven't said it's an error they've said the explanations were an error but they have not actually said the ban was an error like i say it could be but i I'm, i just don't want to get over my skis again and uh, if we go to and and another reason why i think that's interesting is there's a great essay in the Collected Works of Hugh Nibley, Volume 12, called The Best Possible Test. And in there, uh, this was written four years uh, before the priesthood ban was lifted in like 1973. And he talks about, uh, Brother Nibley talks about what a difficult position this put church members in at the time. Uh, and I, I was almost eight years old when the priesthood ban or seven when the priesthood ban was listed and um i can remember that this day i know you didn't want to get into history benjamin so i apologize for the wool gathering here but uh i um I, they made the announcement on the radio it was in june i remember it was summer I, we had one of those station wagons with the wood paneling and i was sitting in the back in the back seat the faces the back that would be banned now for lack of safety, uh, the spirit that came over that car, I still, I will never forget it, my friends. We all cried. There was, I, I, I understand maybe this wasn't universal, but everybody I knew, everybody in my family, there was such joy and gratitude uh, for that. Uh, it, it was a powerful uh, like I said, it's like the Kennedy assassination or the moon landing or 9-11. I, I remember where I was when that was announced. And I remember where it heard. And I remember the joy that, that uh, I felt and, and uh, many others felt. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I, I remember that rejoicing. And, um, and so, and I struggled with this uh, a lot myself and, came to different things and and it's still kind of a personal issue because um 
what what do we do when we're excluded right uh, how how do we do that i have such admiration for those latter day saints uh of of african descent as it was put who still joined the church right uh how did how did they do that you know and and even after that when a lot of these explanations were still current uh they were they were still uh, exclusion based on that and and i know it's not the same but uh through my experience uh with same-sex attraction those of you in the cheap seats in the back that means i'm gay uh i don't use that word but uh anyway um but uh, i uh, when i went uh, public with that uh i there were consequences for me and i am under uh, an unofficial but i think permanent um uh, exclusion from dealing with the youth not because of anything i've done but just because of feelings that happen right I, I, and again it's not a comparison i can go to the temple anytime i want i hold the priesthood right but i was released from uh the calling uh when i was teaching i'm getting emotional again i wasn't expecting to of teaching 17 year old sunday school uh and i told my bishop uh to do that if it was causing too much trouble but uh, it was it was and i think it was the right decision to do that to me even though it's unfair it was unfair uh and it hurts still um uh, and i remember uh one of the young men that i used to teach was passing the sacrament to me and i just started crying uh when that happened and uh so um and it's not because of anything I did, right? It's because of who I am or how I'm perceived. And so, um, and that that hurts and it's unfair, even if it's maybe the right thing because of harmony in the ward and where people are and trust issues. And uh, even though I would never do anything to any of these young young men in the ward, but I was just dropping Nate off my son at the youth, youth conference. And I know I'm never going to be uh, invited. To that and so but why so how how do we deal with for other people right that are in those situations that feel excluded or that feel this do do it still matter and is it still helpful and hugh nibley has this wonderful quote i would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the lord than mingle with the top brass in the tents of the wicked and he's paraphrasing psalms 84 10. Uh, to whom should we go? The disciples said, right? When, or the, when will he also leave me? And people say Jesus wasn't offensive. He called that Samaritan woman a dog. I think he was testing her, but he, he, and then he, at the end, he says, there never was there such great faith as, as in the whole house of Israel, you just showed, but there, there are tests that maybe we undergo, or again, I don't know exactly why Jesus did that. I don't want to get over my skis there either, but but there it's not fair what's happened to me and what happening to other people and yet it can still turn to our good and this still is the place of truth and i would uh even if i'm under certain unofficial exclusions i would still rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the lord because this is the lord's house and i have a testimony of that thank you for such a such a tender and vulnerable thought that was I appreciate that. Mosiah, I think you were next. Yeah, so, man, I'm, I feel like I, I don't want to be this, but I, I, I'm going to be the voice of dissent again. Um, first, let me just say that I agree with everything that has been said. So it's not really maybe a dissent, but maybe more of a confession. I have a, not concerns, I have issues, personal issues, with the answer of I don't know. So I'm not contradicting anything Megan said about I don't know being a powerful thing because I think it has its place for sure. And it, it definitely, it's all gonna come down to faith anyway. So, so and I don't know is what you're gonna get eventually. But I feel like, and maybe this is the lawyer, I mean, I was hoping, uh, what was, I think it was Daniel. Uh, I'm not a lawyer yet, but I, I feel like I can count. But, uh, uh the 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 person the, the personality in me of like having to prove things to people or defend it uh, and having a defense lined up is is innate in me i feel like so that's what i mean by the lawyer in me so in in 
tort law or whenever there's an accident, right? Uh, there's this thing called strict liability. So what this means is that the activity was so dangerous that by you even having done it, it doesn't matter if you were negligent or not. Because it was so dangerous, the fact that you did it, you were negligent. So that could be some kind of um, nuclear waste, waste that you're driving down the highway and it's so corrosive to any material that it'll leak. Um, so that could be an example of that. It's like you just you drove down the highway with, with the nuclear waste and it was so corrosive that no matter what you put it in, you even if you took the biggest precautions that you possibly could have, you cleared the highway, you fixed the highway, you, yeah, you put in multiple containers and one thing um, that it wouldn't leak by the time you got there. Um, and I feel like that's the kind of thing with race is that like we banned an entire race from having access to uh, life-saving ordinance, I mean, not life-saving, uh, exalta exaltating ordinances, and to me, that's like, that's like strict liability, like, no matter what you're doing, that's almost just in its nature negligent, I would say, in terms of spiritual negligence, and I think I have the answer of, like, I don't know when it comes to, like, why would God allow it, because he very much did, right, he very much allowed Brigham Young to put it into place. It, it survived another prophet and another prophet or another prophet. So obviously to a certain point in degree, God didn't just kept striking down the prophets until they figured out that that was the, the thing to change. So yes, sir. So a certain degree, God allowed it. I don't know why. But I feel like even if we go down this road of what's, what's the worst explanation that could possibly exist? And that would be that Brigham Young was a racist individual and that he said it because we already know one thing about God and that God is all about loving all his children. So, and that is pretty well documented on scripture where you can figure that out that that's not the case that God would say blacks are less than whites or whatever it is. So at a certain point in time, the worst, the absolute worst possibility could be that God allowed Brigham Young to be racist and be a racist prophet. And the question is, can you be a racist church leader and receive revelation for the church and fulfill a role of a prophet? And I think the answer is yes. So even if you assume that it is true, doesn't mean that it is, but even if we assume it, doesn't change the legitimacy of the church and i think so many people are afraid that it does that they're just like i can't i can't even explore it i can't even be like sure yeah i could be um i'm so nervous because then that means that the link between joseph smith and president nelson is broken and that means the church is false and then that, that just destroys everything that i had it's just like well, well no that, that's a huge jump you're assuming that there could be no racist person that is in a leadership position in the church especially the highest one at the time that they were there and i feel like that's a big assumption well this is something that i was i was kind of trying to to tiptoe around earlier so i'll say it a little bit more bluntly um, I don't know what I would say to a student. It would actually probably be something like, well, what do you think? And where have you arrived? Because it's, it's a hard conversation. I think what I'm planning to tell my kids, my own kids, is there are some things we don't know and there are some things we do. And we need to emphasize both. Okay? It is entirely possible that, um, that it is entirely possible that an angel appeared to Brigham Young and told him to institute the ban. I think he would have written about that in a journal. I think he would have said something about that that would have been recorded. There would have been some historical evidence of that, right? No, I'm, I'm happy to hold out hope that that's the case. But when I look at it as with the best tools that I have, which are not perfect, I look at this and I say, you know what? There's a good chance that it was just because of one, one man's racism. Um, I, I think that Jeff also says, and I, I really want to emphasize this because I see this happening a lot. We don't get ahead of our skis. In the church, we have a, a belief in authority. We have a belief in respecting authority, and that's very countercultural these days. It's almost cringe to even say something like that. And I have a couple of friends who have basically decided anybody who um, doesn't call the ban directly, clearly, obviously racist is themselves just as guilty of racism. And that's something that I, I, I have a pretty hard time with. And I'll, I'll give you an example why. 
I want you to imagine theoretically that you have um, a, a, you know, a middle school kid whose mom is super racist. And one of the other kids on the soccer field at recess one day says, hey, your mom's a total racist. And the kid gets really mad. Is the kid racist? Or is the kid mad that somebody called his mom a name? I think there's a difference between those two. I'm not excusing him and I'm not saying that he's okay. And I'm not saying that what his mom is doing is all right. But I am saying that there is something to be said for differentiating between the two. And to say like a lot of people really love the church and have complicated feelings. And maybe the best way to sort through this is to give people a little bit of space. I mean, I, I am in the place where I, I suspect it probably was just Brigham Young. Um, and at the same time, when somebody says, well, I'm not sure because I'm like, okay, I'll like, I, I, I can give you that space. I think that's where we are, but if not, that's okay. And not getting ahead of our, our skis is really important. We don't get out in front of the brethren. That's a, That's another principle that we hold to. Um, I must have said something because now everybody's uh, ready to talk. So um, why don't we go with uh, Jason and then Megan and then Mosiah. Very quick. So thanks. That's a good point, Ben. Uh, something that uh, along with what uh, Jeff said, that I appreciate saying where he remembers where he was when it happened. I've heard similar accounts. We had a family friend who was in the BYU library when it uh, was announced. And it uh, did not sound like a library when it was announced. It was wonderful. Everyone was excited and papers were flying, she said. Uh, and you know, I've wondered too, you know, why did it take so long? Uh, you know, at that point, by 1978, society had, you know, we'd had a civil rights movement. It was moving forward, and some were asking, why does the church still have this? And a lot of saints were. And so, you know, perhaps you know, the Lord wanted the saints to really want it and to really be invested. Um, I can say, uh, obviously, I wasn't there, but uh, my, my mother tells me my father was ordained to the priesthood. It was a rather large circle. He was the, I believe, the first one, first black one ordained to that ward uh, in uh, Indiana in the uh, 79 or 80 and you know people were excited to be part of that um and also thought about why it was a revelation you know we as far as i can tell uh it was an administrative action you mentioned ben that there's no record of an angel maybe there was uh, but if it was administrative policy why did it take a revelation to overturn and for me it makes sense because then there's you know no you mentioned authority well revelation is about the ultimate authority in our church and if god says thou shalt we say okay uh, there's there's no arguing with that, and and I've learned some of the other uh, you know counter arguments and and uh, articles and other thoughts, but Revelation says this is it. Uh, that's that's the line of the sandwich. So I think it's wonderful um, for us to, to recognize that you know that it is God's will has been received, uh, and it's, there's no reason to to doubt that. Uh, the history behind it, yeah, is is interesting. It's difficult, uh, and I look forward to learning more about it. But. Yeah, maybe, Ben, in addition to Brother uh, Corbett's uh, essays that Megan mentioned, we could put in the show notes uh, Edward Kimball's uh, compilation of the, he's collected the experiences of every everybody. It turns out everybody who was there shared their experience in the Quorum of the Twelve, the First Presidency, and how powerful it was. And, and to pick up on what you just said, Jason, that they Nobody could deny that, right? And there were some defenders of the old system, but that was such a powerful experience that it was really clear what the Lord wanted. And maybe if it had just been an administrative action, there might have been some holdouts or more resistance. That's a great perspective, Jeff. I hadn't thought of that. Elder McConkie was pretty clear about what he had said up until that time. And when it, was, when it came through, a number of people have said, well, Elder McConkie was humble and he changed. Maybe. Uh, I think also like... Uh, how do I say this? I don't think that it was peer pressure. Does that make sense? I think that's how I would say that. Um, I can't remember who I said was next. Was it Megan and then Mosiah? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. So um, I, I really appreciated what Mosiah said. You know, um, I'm, I've thought through a lot of those things myself and struggled with some of those same questions and thoughts. And like I said, I still, I don't know the answers, but one thing that I have come to see um, is that I, I think there's a tendency to assume that I see a lot of people who, who emphasize prophetic fallibility, which, which, which is um, something, you know, that, that is a, a teaching in our church. I've seen people sort of, and I don't think Mosiah did this, but his comment reminded me of this. They almost push that they elevate it almost to like an article of faith. <laughs> okay. It is, it, it is something in our church, but it's not frequently emphasized by the brethren. I have heard them say it in conference, but it's, it's not a frequent thing. 
And I think that there's a tendency to think that there's something inherently more sophisticated about a testimony that says, well, sometimes the church is wrong, but that doesn't mean that God's wrong or that the church's ultimate destiny will be wrong. Um, I don't think that that's an inherently problematic take, but I also don't think that it's inherently more sophisticated. I do think that you can have thought through the issues and still come to a place where you have that simple faith that with all of the things that we don't know, that the Lord is still in charge, that the church is, is still, that even with other people's agency being in play, he can still guide and direct his church. And I, I, I have seen so many times in my life when I have tried to stay focused on the good, on, on what we do know, that at a later point in my discipleship, um, I start to gain some context that starts to make sense of things that didn't make sense earlier. And I, I hold that out just as um, a hope for people that are really struggling with this, just to tell them that the Lord can speak peace to your heart on these matters. And if you'll stay with him, stay with your covenants, stay in the church, trust um, the brethren. That doesn't mean they're perfect, but trust that the Lord does reveal his will to his servants. You may come, I, I know that you will come to a, a point where you say, I am so glad I stayed. I'm, I'm, I may not have all the answers, but things are starting to make more sense. And um, that, you know, I, I guess uh, President Corb, his essays, you know, where he's kind of talking about how he has seen the glory of the Lord revealed in his life as he's wrestled with these issues. I can think of that on a host of other issues in my own life. Um, so I just wanted to put that forward as like, you know, um, being in a place where you won't move forward because you're holding the Lord hostage to your questions is not going to work out the way you want it to. <laughs> I think that's great. Mosiah, why don't we let you have the last word? That was so awesome, Megan, because I'm glad you said that because you're right. There, the idea that of you would be like, well, I've thought it through and the worst thing that could possibly happen is Brigham Young's racist son of a gun, you know, and that's just, he's got to repent for that. And like, that doesn't mean that like you're, you have somehow resolved this question of faith <laughs> for everyone or you're the wisest philosopher because I, I had a debate with a friend one time and he, it was just like a passing Facebook comment. And I just kind of like, we just kind of went, 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 And then he like, we stopped. And then he reached out like the next day and was like, Hey, like I have serious doubts about my faith. Like he, he, like, I really have all these questions and I loved how logical you were. And he put like a lot of credit on my logic. And I, I like, I mean, well, yeah, like that makes me feel good. But, but, but as the, he asked me these questions and wanted me to help him, on this journey of figuring out the conclusion, he had everything. I, I gave him every answer and he even appreciated some and criticized a little bit here. But the one thing he was missing was the faith. So like, even when I had a super complex, but clear and thorough response, it didn't matter. <laughs> it was like, just, it, was, it was a bust because what he was missing was the faith. So I, I think you, what, what I would just add to that is that I think what members of the church need to have is less, they don't, they need to have less fear because perfect love casts out fear. And like when you're not afraid, you're able to receive revelation and be able to be better able to answer people's questions and even for yourself. So I, I think that's what, what I would lean on is that, um, and just to go back to your comment, Ben, about the, the kid who, you know, is angry about someone calling his mother racist, I would say that that kid has fear. Fear about what that means about his mom. Fear about what that means about himself. Um, fear about what that means in terms of their righteousness. And I think, is the kid wrong? for feeling that i would say no but how he proceeds will show something about him 
um, I'm afraid of, def of criticizing someone who's racist. And that carries weight with it, that, that carries consequences with it. And, but I think um, I was talking to a friend and I told, told Ben, I told Ben this in a conversation. I told a friend one time with the plan of salvation, we have the celestial kingdom, terrestrial, celestial. So no matter what you do, you could get a C in life and you'll still get a degree. So C's get degrees, it's a eternal truth. <laughs> and my friend told me I was wrong. He said, you're wrong. And I was like, why? Wow. Like, I just explained it to you. He's a member too. And he, he said, you're wrong because it's F's. F's get degrees. And I just blew my mind where I was just like, whoa, like you could totally fail life. And you're still going to, to get a degree. And I just realized that that changes my perspective on, okay, well, like, what does it mean about someone being afraid to criticize racism? It means that they're afraid and there's some negative consequences that will come from that. But in the eternal scheme of things, well, they're going to do just fine in the planet. They're going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. The person that they, their mother persecuted is going to be great. And I'm okay with that. Does that mean that that person should probably buck up and grapple with their fear? Yeah, but they don't. They're, sure, get an F or get a C or get a D, get a B or a B plus, whatever that is. It's just going to work out. I think that's a beautiful take and i think and i want to be clear i'm not trying to to say that that kid is like off the hook right i'm not saying that at all i think the reason why that analogy struck me it came to me the other day is like you can feel compassion for someone and realize that somebody feeling fear does not mean that they're evil and you can try and at least like put yourself in their shoes and walk through it and i don't know just i i think that there are are ways that we can handle this well um, that it can be scary, but perfect love casteth out all fear. That we can try our very best. We can pursue truth. We can admit the things we do know in addition to the, the things that we don't know. Um, you all have been such a joy. Um, I don't think that we um, have covered everything. I don't think. I think there are a lot of other things we could say. Um, I still have some frustrations with some people who are who are, I think, more interested in beating up on the church than they are in like getting at the right. Um, but you all have just been really, really wonderful. Um, and I hope that, that people take away from this, that there are some things that they can do to try and make the world a little bit better, to clarify the, the ways the church has changed in the past few years, to make sure that it's really clear that some comments are no longer allowed, right? And that some of the things that we used to think we believed, we don't anymore. And as Jeff pointed out, they weren't just oral, they were written, right? They were almost doctrine, I think is a better way to say it, not just oral tradition, but almost doctrine. Um, and that it's good that we leave those things behind really deliberately. Um, that we can love Brad Wilcox without loving every, uh, without loving his take, right? Um, that we can support him and stand for him without necessarily standing for everything that he said. Um, well, it is late. I've kept you all too long, uh, much longer than I thought I would. And I can hear my kids going nuts in the background. So I'm going to go and run and help my wife. But God bless you all. And thank you. Um, Radical Civility is a project of Public Square Magazine. And uh, the opinions expressed are only the opinions of the people involved. And even they, hopefully, um, all of us will change our opinions as time goes on and we'll become smarter and wiser over time. Thank you all very much. Go and do some good in the world. And I will talk to you all later. Hey, folks, just a quick closing thought. Um, the other day I saw, um, I, I hope you could tell that my friends are good people and they're trying. Um, I think this is a good discussion. Uh, like I told you at the beginning, I don't think it fixes anything, but it shows people who are really trying. And I think that's something worth modeling and something worth signal boosting. And there's another thing that I wanted to signal boost really quick. I was uh, reading online and looking at different people's takes and I saw Tarek LaCour, um, who's a black member of the church. And uh, he, he said, you know, I'm a little bit surprised. People often ask me, how I can forgive on matters like race. And my answer to them is, I'm a Christian, forgiving is what I do. I don't think that implies cheap forgiveness. And if I were to say that, it would come off as cheap or hollow. But coming from somebody who uh, has every right to be upset, um, I think that that is an example to me of bigness of heart and the kind of signal that I think should be boosted, the kind of person, the kind of forgiveness. And I hope that someday when something happens to me like that, that I can be as mature 
and is gracious. Um, and that is a message that I think the whole world could use right now. And that's without implying cheap grace or easy forgiveness. I think it needs to be real and heartfelt and deep. Um, but I think that forgiving quickly, I am a Christian. Forgiveness is what I do. It's a pretty good note to end on. Thank you all for joining us. I hope that you got something out of it today. Like I said, I hope you give us a little bit of grace if we made any mistakes, but I think we tried and I hope that we did a little bit of good. So with that, God bless, good luck, and hope you go and do some good in the world. Bye, everybody.